Welcome to episode 180 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of this episode at the show notes, which is www.7, so the word all spelt out, S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 180. Real Health Radio is presented by 7 Health. 7 Health works with women who feel obsessed with and defined by their bodies. Using a non-diet, weight-neutral approach that combines science and compassion, we help clients transform their physical, mental, and emotional health. We specialize in helping clients overcome disordered eating, body dissatisfaction, and negative body image, regain their periods, balance their hormones, and recover from years of dieting by learning how to listen to their bodies. We're currently taking on new clients. If you're ready to put an end to your diet struggles and heal your relationship with food and your body, please get in contact. Head over to www.7-health.com forward slash help, and there you can read about how you work with clients and apply for a free initial chat. The address again is www.7-health.com forward slash help, and I'll also include that in the show notes. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. I'm your host, Chris Sandal. I hope you are settling into the new year. Uh, at the time of recording this intro, it's just after Christmas, and by the time you will be listening to it, I should be arriving in Sydney, Australia as part of a much-needed holiday. This week on the show, it's a guest interview, and I'm chatting with Dr. Jennifer Gaudiani. Dr. Gaudiani is the founder and medical director of the Gaudiani Clinic. Board certified in internal medicine, she completed her undergraduate degree at Harvard Medical School at Boston University School of Medicine and her internal medicine residency and chief residency at Yale. Dr. Gaudiani has been a leader in the eating disorder field for over 10 years and served as the medical director at the Acute Center for Eating Disorders prior to founding the Gaudiani Clinic which is a Denver-based outpatient medical clinic dedicated to people with uh, eating disorders and disordered eating. The Gaudiani Clinic is a health at every size informed provider and embraces treating people of all shapes and sizes. The Gaudiani Clinic is licensed to practice in over 32 US states via telemedicine and offers international professional consultations and education. Dr. Gaudiani has lectured internationally and nationally, is widely published in the scientific literature as well as on blogs, is a current member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Eating Disorders and the Academy for Eating Disorder Medical Care Standards Committee, and is a former former board member of IADEP. Dr. Gaudiani is one of a very small number of internal medicine physicians who is certified as an eating disorder expert. She's also a fellow in the Academy for Eating Disorders. Uh, Dr. Gaudiani's first book, Sick Enough, A Guide to Medical Complications of Eating Disorders, was released by uh, Rutledge uh, in October 2018 and is available on Amazon. So I've known of Dr. Gardiani for a number of years. I think I first came across her through Tabitha Farrar's podcast. Uh, she's been a guest on it multiple times. Um, and then more recently, she wrote the book Sick Enough, which I read and enjoyed. So I wanted to invite her on the show to, to chat about it. So as part of this episode, we start off by talking about Dr. Gaudiani's background and how she ended up working in the eating disorder field. Uh, while she never had an eating disorder herself, she counts herself lucky considering she has many of the personality traits that are often associated with this or with developing an eating disorder. So we spend a bit of time chatting about this. We then just spend the majority of the time touching on topics and ideas based on a book. So why she called it sick enough, uh, values-driven recovery, uh, the cave person's brain and her house on fire analogy, uh, misconceptions around pulse rate and bone density in athletes with eating disorders, uh, weight stigma and binge eating disorder, uh, eating disorders in older patients and in male patients, uh, orthorexia, uh, the overlap between substance abuse and eating disorders, and conversations to be having with teenagers to protect them from eating disorders. And I really enjoyed this conversation. Dr. Gaudiani has 
uh, a really warm and lovely nature to her and just having this time or this chance to spend this time with her and chat about such an important topic was was wonderful so let's get on with the show here is my conversation with dr jennifer gaudiani hey dr g thanks so much for joining me on the show today thank you so much for having me chris um so your book was released at the start of this year, so start of 2019, Um, at least that's when we're recording this. It's called Sick Enough, A Guide to the Medical Complications of Eating Disorders. I've read it. It's a fantastic resource. And so what I want to do today is use many of the ideas that are touched on in the book as the, the basis for our chat, and then we can just see what other rabbit holes and directions we go down as, as part of that. Um, but as, as a starting place, do you want to give listeners a bit of background on yourself, a, a bio of sorts, like who you are, what training you've done, that sort of thing? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. So I grew up in Northern California, the oldest of three girls, and I went off to college where I was an English major and a pre-med. And in medical school, my middle sister arrived in college and had developed an eating disorder. Um, I knew nothing about them except that I loved her infinitely and was confident that would be insufficient. Um, So she got a therapist and struggled with her eating disorder for many years, finally getting fully recovered in her mid-20s. But I will tell you that witnessing and walking that journey with her was really scary. It was also inspiring to me to see her recover. And I think that it particularly impacted me because I felt that there was a shift in me. You know, I have many of the temperamental traits that my patients also possess. And uh, it is, I think, a fluke and somewhat uh, mysterious to me why I didn't myself develop an eating disorder. But I think that as somebody who had the privileges of, you know, white, cis, hetero, thin, able, and all of those things, I was certainly um, experiencing body pressures and self-assessment based on body appearance myself. And I think as my sister went through her disorder, as I, you know, gave her my love and my inexpert support, I spoke the words to her enough that I came to deeply believe them at an early age, which was, don't take your emotions out on your body. Whatever you eat is okay. It's it's all going to be all right. Trust your body. And I think I said it to her enough that I recognized a shift in myself as I was in medical school thinking, huh, you know, I'm a little bit less aware of this or, or, you know, bothered by it in myself now. Oh, what I'm telling her, I think is probably right. So that was an interesting inspiration to me and, um, her courageous journey and willingness to share her story has, has been, uh, remarkable. I went and did my internal medicine residency then at Yale in my chief residency and uh, loved taking care of the whole person. And actually, I was also inspired by a dear family friend who developed type 1 diabetes as a child and then a few years later began to develop anorexia concurrent with it vis-a-vis floating her blood sugars or not taking enough insulin. And I watched, you know, even at a much younger age than medical school, as the Western medical institution systematically failed her. You know, when she was brave enough to say to the endocrinologist, hey, um, you know, the reason I'm running A1Cs that are extremely high is because I am afraid of gaining weight and this is a thing for me. And, you know, invariably the older white male endocrinologist would give her a virtual pat on the head and say, well, you know, let's just start by getting your blood sugars under control and really failed her. So as I, as I progressed as a young doctor, I thought, I wonder if I can use these two inspirations to be the kind of doctor that, that really feels congruent with my values. What if I can invite the patient to share their narrative with me And I can in turn meet them halfway with my medical knowledge. And together we can find a common language to make whatever they're dealing with a little bit more manageable, 
on, on terms that they care about. So that was the sort of ethos that I went into my residency with never thinking that I would specialize in eating disorders because I was an internist and (laughs) there are no internists who specialize in eating disorders. Um, And so when I moved to Denver 12 years ago, I had the opportunity to become a leader at uh, a hospital-based unit here that specializes in multidisciplinary medical stabilization of critically ill adults with anorexia nervosa and helps to run that unit for eight years and published and learned and spoke to, to various different audiences. And that was kind of it for me. I mean, it landed in my lap unexpectedly, but I that was it. I fell in love with the field. And then three years ago, I left on warm terms to open my own outpatient medical clinic because I wanted to see that full story. I wanted to be with my patients and with a much more diverse group of patients through all the chapters of their lives, not just during a hospitalization. And so that brings me to this day. Nice. So look, there, there's a lot that I want to dig back into. I think the the thing when you talked about with your sister and you said, look, a lot of your temperament is the same as hers and it's almost like a, a fluke that you weren't the one that ended up in that position. So maybe talk a little bit about, I don't know, your childhood, your upbringing, like how was, how was food in your household? Yeah, thanks. That's always a really interesting question. Uh, you know, there were strong positives and there were some interesting negatives. On the positive side, I'm of Italian heritage and there's a really strong culture of food and food with family in yeah. Italian culture, even several generations uh, of Americanization in. So I think that there was quite a lot of structure around food in my family. We were not, you know, we I came from a well-to-do family. There was always plenty of food and family meals kept relatively low chaos around food by counterpoint with what some of my patients do experience. That was protective, um, as was the cuisine that that my, my mom and then eventually my dad as well cooked, which had no orthorexic tendencies to it whatsoever. Fats were used in delicious abundance. And uh, there was, thankfully at the time, it would have been utterly bizarre to suggest uh, in the 80s and 90s that carbs were an issue, so you know, that <laughs> that didn't uh, arise on my on my horizon. Um, and so we ate delicious food, plenty of it, and usually in a family setting. Those were protective things. Um, I was athletic. I would not say I was necessarily an athlete, um, but uh, I think my my relationship with movement was one of you know joy and. Um, confidence on the whole. The negatives were that um, my dad came from a really fat phobic family and brought that into our home in myriad unfortunate ways in retrospect. And my mom, who is as brilliant and accomplished as she was gorgeous, was you know, coming of age professionally at a time that feminism was just dawning. And she had a lot of um, self doubt. And I think that it wasn't popular for women to be super capable and super bright. So the easy out was to put herself down, especially her physical appearance. And there was just endless chatter around, Oh, I shouldn't eat this. I'm being bad. Or, you know, sort of a relationship between food and exercise and body size. Um, or the fact that I even knew my mother's weight growing up is super bizarre. Um, (laughs) so I think that there was a lot of that that was swimming through my head and definitely programmed me to recognize not just in society, but also at home, that there was clearly being power and privilege ascribed to certain body types more than others. Yeah. And did that then play out as well with school friends and, and like, was it in that everyone was dieting when you were a teenager? Is, is that your experience? 
Yeah. My experience, you know, I ran with the nerd crowd. So, you know, I was, <laughs> I was not amongst the, uh, the popular girls who, you know, maybe were a little bit more aware of their appearance. Um, but uh, you know, nonetheless, if a friend of mine lost weight, either incidentally or perhaps with some intent, they got attention, interesting attention for a teenager, attention from boys. Um, and you know, that all influenced me. That was definitely in my heart. Right. And so did you have a strong period where you were, were dieting or going from one diet to another that you can remember? Interestingly enough, I love food too much to have ever gone too far down atypical eating. Okay. I, you know, every, as a teenager, absolutely. Every a couple of days here and there, thinking about it too much. But I think I've always really loved food and again, never got by quirk. I I can't explain it now how this didn't happen, but, um, I never restricted sufficiently that that binge urge, I think, um, became more prominent. So it always stayed relatively moderate. Okay. And in terms of, uh, your sister, was there was there anything that was different as part of her experience than your experience? Like, was there more pressure on her from from friends, or was there anything that you can uh, point to towards why it was her and not you? You know, I could I could postulate she was <laughs> definitely in a somewhat more popular group of friends. She's naturally built curvier in a society that does not honor that. And I think that her temperament was such that she had just that little bit more of sensitivity to life's vicissitudes and to social interactions that I think were harder for her to sit with. She was so passionate and caring and so influenced by, you know, a social relationship that was going awry um, that I think it may have made her more vulnerable to everything that restricting calories meant, uh, yeah. and that eventually, um, purging meant as well. And did you like to, uh, as sisters, was there any ever dieting, uh, talk amongst you guys or like that Never. wasn't a relationship? No, not for a heartbeat. And, you know, even before she arrived at college, when she started talking about, Hey, I'm, I'm worried about my weight and I'm, I can feel myself eating less. I would continually give her the good messages, eat all the good food, get all of your meals in, get all of the snacks in. your body needs all of this energy. So fortunately, I think there was a, there was not a competitiveness. There was a, a, a great tenderness and a feeling of protectiveness, a recognition that there are certain things that are good for you and certain things that clearly won't do you any good. And given that this is the profession you've now ended up in, was the care that she got as part of her recovery, was that something that just was luckily very good, was luckily or unluckily very bad? How how did it play out for her? It was luckily very good. She had a series of terrific therapists as she finished school and moved on to graduate school and work that I think were great. She never had to step up to a higher level of care. I look back and wince at my own, you know, super uneducated attempts to support her. Like, listen, if it would help you, I can listen to everything you've eaten that day. I mean, goodness mercy, that was not my role. (laughs) On the positive side, I didn't screw it up in the sense that, you know, I was always giving her what I now know to be sort of fundamentally sound advice, but wow, that was not my place. So, you know, I think, uh, (laughs) if I were to have my current wisdom back when I was in my early twenties, yep, I might've done some things differently myself, but, um, she got good care. Okay, good. And did you, was it that time as well, because of what she was going through, did you start to read, uh, books or websites or material around eating disorders at that stage, or that came a little later? It actually, I never did. I'm embarrassed to say it's a great question. Um, it really, it wasn't until I had the opportunity to get into the field and help to grow and run this hospital-based program that I just threw myself into reading and learning. 
And so how was it when you first started in that hospital-based program? Because I think for, if I speak for myself, like there is so much that as a lay person, you just don't understand about eating disorders in terms of how they work, how they affect the body. And so to, to go from being someone who really doesn't understand it to be thrown into that, how, how was it? Mm. It was fantastic and I made lots of mistakes. Um, I loved it from the very get-go and I think I was probably benefited by the fact that when I joined, it was a two-bed program and then when I left, it was a 15-bed program. So it's not that I jumped into a completely full service. You know, I I learned and, um, you know, I, I think... I really enjoy learning from my patients themselves and then from a multidisciplinary team. So it's information that I feel I absorb pretty quickly. But gosh, I mean, I made a zillion mistakes. I continue to make important mistakes on at least a weekly basis and um, just try to not respond to my innate fragility reaction of defensiveness or defeat and instead say, how fortunate I am thank you for teaching me this. I apologize that I made a mistake. I'm going to do better next time. So I think it was really with that attitude that I came into it. And I just, the whole deal, I absolutely loved it. And was, was health at every size, was that a part of that practice? Oh my goodness, no. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I really was late to the health at every size party. Uh, really not until I opened my outpatient clinic and knew that I wanted to see patients of all genders, ages, body shapes, and sizes, and all eating disorder diagnoses that I realized I needed to do some some fast learning. Uh, I can't even remember the first time I heard about Hayes and weight-inclusive care, but it was early on in the course of my outpatient work. And really, as soon as As I heard about it, I was like, oh, of course, of course. But I benefited tremendously from some very patient, wise, thoughtful teachers who really helped me understand where my years of medical training and practice, no matter how kindly intended, had done harm, had not helped people and were based in a system that is as archaic as it is useless. Yeah. And and so were you reaching out to these people and saying, hey, I've discovered this concept. I know you know a lot about it. Can you give me more help on this? Or or it was more in terms of interactions while where they came across something you've read and and were trying to correct your, what, what you were talking about? It was both. I okay. really sought out experts to try to get myself up to speed. But interestingly, there are almost no physicians practicing under a Hayes model. So I was fortunate enough to be learning Hayes from wonderful dietitians and therapists, but still there was not the kind of supervision that could be like, here's how to practice outpatient medicine through a haze lens. You know, I think I had to bring the concepts in and again, make a couple of uh, public mistakes and, and be like, woo, okay, gosh, clearly did not get that. Let me try again. Um, and get corrected and push myself. I mean, my, my like uncomfortable learning edge was being really challenged over the last few years, but at the same time, I felt so excited about it because it, you know, all of my work in eating disorders had left me with this deep desire for a concept that would unify care across the entire spectrum, not one type of care for one group of people and another almost opposing type of care for another set of people. Yeah. And do you, like at at this stage, do you speak at medical conferences where, I don't know, haze is not the norm? Is is that part of what you do at this point? Yeah. You know, uh, traditionally, I have done most of my speaking at eating disorder conferences. And I think although haze is finally becoming more and more mainstream, thanks to resources like you, um, 
and others that you've had on your show, it's still the, the actual universal application of it remains non-mainstream, even in eating disorder circles, lamentably. So I think when I speak at eating disorder conferences, I'm still, I hope, helping to educate people on how weight-inclusive care can truly be applied and how much more beneficial it is mentally and medically for individuals of all body sizes, um, as well as just sort of bringing social justice awareness, broadly speaking, into my practice. But I am going to start to do a little bit more broader medical conversations. What's interesting about sort of do I speak to physicians primarily? They're not interested. <laughs> they don't want me. They they don't want to hear it. Um, and I, you know, I say that as a profound generalization. There are some wonderful physicians who are curious and open and intrigued, like I was. Um, but there is a lot that just think, nope. And, and there's a lot of resistance still. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I was reflecting on, on this um, and it feels like because of the kind of work that, that we do and you're on that front line of seeing how destructive dieting and complicated relationships with food really are, that it feels like we would be the first group of people to get haze as a, as a concept and then it sort of moves out to places where i don't know there isn't just so obvious um this connection between why this would be a good idea absolutely and i really have hope that you know because haze does make so much sense and because some of the early data uh, i'm in the process of compiling early data that I'll try to publish next year with my co-authors, because the early data look so sensational as far as medical outcomes, radically better than the diet culture focused ethos we've got currently. Um, my hope is that it will be adopted. And I think there's also, you know, little pools of medical students here and there who are like, hey, we've heard of this. This sounds right. And they're starting to demand more inclusion in their curricula. So, I am hopeful, but we're in early days. And I say that respecting the fact that the true progenitors of Hayes and weight-inclusive care have been waiting decades uh, for any movement and momentum. Yeah. And so you mentioned about sort of setting up your own clinic more recently, and it's an outpatient clinic. Was there any thought of you setting up your own inpatient facility? And I, I mean, thinking of someone like Carolyn Cosson or doing something of that of that ilk? Sure. You know, Carolyn Coston is a beloved friend and I'm inspired by the folks who created some of the first uh, IP residential programs. You know, I'm really interested in what happens when people stay in their own lives and and, you know, have the benefits and motivations of seeing what they care about while also seeking treatment. Now, for the people who need a higher level of care, 100%, I have referral relationships all over the country and routinely send patients to a higher level of care when necessary. However, the way that U.S. insurance works, at least, it's becoming more and more difficult to get comprehensive benefit from the higher levels of care because insurance is reluctant to accept someone or to approve someone. They are having a tendency to cut services way too early. They uh, then put patients who are in the baby stages of a recovery back into their home environment with just enough care to sort of be in that no man's land of mental and physical challenges. And then patients think they can't get better. So I think um, what I'm really interested in doing is helping people within their outpatient world medically, as long as it's appropriate, working with a multidisciplinary team that includes a dietitian and a therapist and trying to help them here. Because I think having taken care of some of the most medically compromised patients in the country for quite a long time, um, I'm interested in um, what can happen you know, the, the sort of the needs medically of everyone else who either 
doesn't require that higher level of care or who's been failed by it or who just can't bear to go back to it. So I, I think this is um, a really fun setting for me in which to live my clinical values. Yeah. And I mean, you you said values there and you sort of alluded to it as well. Like one of the things I took from your book is how big values are and using a client's values as part of the recovery piece. So do you want to just talk a little about that? I'd love to. You know, I am not a therapist. I never play therapist, but to the extent that I understand the basics, I'm really interested in ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, and its values basis. Uh, It was what was broadly used on my prior program, and it appeals to me as a pragmatic, thoughtful approach. So when I first meet a patient, because all of my patients need to come to me in person for a two-hour initial assessment, and then I can follow them up by telemedicine around the country, um, I invite them to share with me as the first piece of information they speak, what are their goals and values? It's so easy in a hierarchical, power-infused medical system, even in the dyad of me as a friendly, laid-back, nice you know, physician, there's still power in the room. So for me to work on decreasing my assumptiveness by asking patients what they want for themselves and then using that as my roadmap and not making assumptions about, you know, what their outcomes should be or what they'd want or what feels possible to them. That's such a powerful start for the two of us. And then they're naming their values, the things that matter to them in their lives just begins to help me understand them as a whole human. I don't think I can provide good medical care without that. Yeah. And there's actually the place that I will typically start with clients as well. I prefer to do it in a, as a writing assignment just so they have more time to think about it. I mm. prefer to have more time to go through it. So getting them to do a, a writing assignment on what's your identity, what's your values, what's your priorities. Mm. And there's questions with, with all of those. Um, and I find it, I find it really helpful. The one thing that comes up a lot when I get them to do that writing exercise for values is, There'll be things like compassion and and um, uh, caring for others and and all of these values and it, it, I'm always like and how do these values then apply when you turn them inwards because yeah. people seem to be a lot better at having values that they then have for others than being able to hold themselves to that so those same values and so that's always kind of an an interesting conversation to have. Isn't it? I I think that's such a lovely point. And I find it helpful when I do have somebody who's struggling with whatever I'm encouraging them, inviting them to do next for their recovery work medically, to bring it back to their values. You know, listen, what you told me really mattered to you was this. And let's just take a quick check in because I know the eating disorder is being such a jerk right now and is so powerful. But is it taking you toward that value or is it indeed taking you away from that? Because if it's taking you away from that, then your values and my recommendations are congruent with each other. Let's find a way to try to push through. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a difference between uh, like lived values versus aspired to values. Right. Yeah. Um, and one of the, the other bits that I want to talk about is just how difficult it can be for people to get a diagnosis and this then feeding into really the, the title of the book of like people not feeling sick enough to, to warrant care. So yeah, do you want to talk a little about that? Yeah, I would love to. I think on a fundamental level, we're up against a lot of huge obstacles. We have physical symptoms caused by eating disorders that intermingle with diagnoses that occur alongside eating disorders like anything from type 1 diabetes to migraines to substance use disorder, but that themselves are worsened by the eating disorder. And then those get mixed up in symptoms that get worse due to stress and anxiety. So then we end up in a medical system where only that which is measurable is true and where mind-body connection are not honored 
or seen. And where dietary restraint is the new defining behavior of virtuosity in our society, and where we have a society-wide epidemic of restriction that triggers sort of groupthink, and that as long as someone, as long as there's such a thing as looking healthy, medical providers are going to miss and harm patients. So that's sort of, in a nutshell the challenges that <laughs> our beloved patients are up against when they walk into the clinic, besides all of the, you know, just systematic challenges of access to care and, you know, and the like. So it's a big challenge. Um, but what I've really tried to do in my personal one-on-one -on -one care, in my writing and in my podcasting is to offer a model in which one can actually, with time and relationship and thoughtfulness, slowly make progress on how all of these factors interact. I named the book Sick Enough because, well, you've, you've written about this yourself, of course, brilliantly. Um, so many people just don't feel that they're sick enough, no matter what phase of their eating disorder they're in. Yeah. And with the internet, they can always find someone who on terms that they arbitrarily point to appears to be sicker than they and they, they conclude, because of this being a mental illness, I'm not worthy of going and spending resources or finding expertise or even just taking on the demands of my eating disorder. It's not worth it because I'm not sick enough to do that. And my message to patients is anyone who has a disordered relationship between food and their body is sick enough to get care. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think when I wrote about it, <clears throat> my take was just, do you want things to be better than they currently are? And if that is the case, then it doesn't matter whether you're sick enough in inverted commas. It just matters. I thought that, that was such a great point. Yes. Yeah. You, you want to get better. And you have a really great analogy for this in terms of like the house on fire analogy, which I, yeah. Can you share that with people? I'd love to. So the house on fire metaphor is one that I will introduce relatively early on if I suspect that a patient might benefit from it. I really like speaking in metaphor, A, because I was an English major, and B, <laughs> because I think sometimes speaking in stories gets around that part of the brain that's guarded by the eating disorder and ready to leap defensively or not hear. So the, the house on fire story goes as follows, and I'll just happen to use a female pronoun for the character in this story. There's a young woman standing outside her burning house. And the fire department comes roaring up and the firefighter jumps out and says, we're here to put out your fire. And she goes, what fire? And the firefighter says, well, <laughs> your fire, I see the flames, I feel the heat, I smell the smoke. And she goes, oh, no, if I had a house fire, it would be so hot that the pavement would be bubbling. And because the pavement's not bubbling, I couldn't possibly have a house fire. So the firefighter understands that this individual is mentally ill and puts out her damn fire. And, and the, the, the message that I give to my patients when they say, but Dr. G, I'm getting a 4.0. My potassium's okay. My weight's not that bad. My weight's not low at all. Um, my, my vital signs are normal. My labs are normal. Is that I'll just look at them and say, oh, pavement bubbling. <laughs> you know, and then they laugh and they're irritated and, you know, we move on. Yeah. Definitely. And it's, I mean, the, the other analogy or the, the thing that I think about is when people talk about hitting rock bottom and you hear someone's story and you're like, how was rock bottom like not two years prior to this? Mm. And, and so, yeah, the, the, the point at which someone typically thinks, okay, now I need to, now I need to do something about this. You don't want someone to end up at that place. Like that, that is such a difficult place, like mentally, emotionally, but also physically, um, that like, that is just so dangerous. And you're then still hoping that someone's going to hit that point of recognition. Well, that's right. I think the concept of rock bottom it can be used internally as an excuse to proceed with the disorder and you can end up in a really dangerous game of chicken with mortality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, where, you know, well didn't feel too hot yesterday, but 
I'm going to do the same thing today or maybe go a little tighter and let's just see because I might not have hit rock bottom yesterday. Well, you know what? Rock bottom might be your coffin, friend. It might be permanent physical or neurological damage and past experiences don't predict future physiologic responses. So what you were able to tolerate three, 10, 20 years ago gosh, you might not be able to now. And so, you know, very often, and and you mentioned this in your blog on the concept of sick enough as well, when patients, um, you know, compare themselves presently to a prior state of illness and conclude they're not as bad as then. So why make any changes or, or why, you know, do something different? What I encourage my patients to say is, or to think about is, Let's not compare you to your quote unquote worst day. Yep. Let's compare you to the vision of your future that you've told me matters to you, where you're working, you're in school, you're enjoying your dog, you're having fun with your children, your sister. And let's compare you today with that future vision, the delta between the, the difference between today and what you actually fundamentally wish for yourself, that's what makes room for change. That's where we say, oh my goodness, well, I'm nowhere close to that. That's where patients say, you know, I've eaten well for a week, so I figure I'm now fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, hmm, no, because honey, here's what's fine is going to look like. Fine is going to look like X, Y, and Z and not thinking about your weight 15 times a day and not being unkind to yourself and not pushing yourself when you need to rest and not choosing food based on some theoretical moral valence of it instead of just what sounds tasty to you in the moment. And when you go over some of those features of fine, each one individual, of course, the patient can be like, oh yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm nowhere close to that. I see. Yeah. And I think that's really important to use that as, as you say, the, the comparison as opposed to just, oh, I was so much worse X number of months ago or X number of years ago. Because for a lot of clients that I work with, they will have had a point where it was worse. Yeah. And it's that thing of, well, things are obviously better now. So do I really need to try? Like m maybe this is as good as it gets. Um, and, and the kind of the, the analogy I always often will use is like, okay, previously you were at a, at a one out of 10. Now mm. you're at a two out of, out of 10 and you just don't understand that you're at a two out of 10 because that's become your norm. But you'll see when you're at a 10 out of 10, just how much of a difference there is between where you are currently at. Mm, that's a really powerful point. I think as well, I talk to my patients sometimes about sick exceptionalism where, <laughs> you know, the sure that's all fine for everyone else, but it doesn't apply to me. So let's say that I have a patient who is a beloved dog owner and they say, you know, Dr. G, why do I have to make changes now if my labs look okay and dot, dot, dot also looks all right. And I say, look, it makes intrinsic sense to you that you would never wait until your dog's potassium was abnormal or until their vital signs were abnormal to give them their supper and their water. You know, they get those because they're mammals, period. That actually applies to you too. And, you know, inevitably it's, but I'm different. It's yeah. different for me because, <laughs> and my answer is, you're a mammal. Let's really, if we can keep it in the simplest terms possible, it isn't actually different for you. Yeah. So let's then use that. I mean, you, you talk a lot in your book about the, the cave person brain and so you making reference to being a mammal. Let's, let's talk about that for a little bit and just what the cave person brain is, is trying to do, but also how the body is then damaged as part of restriction and, and, all the, the components that that does to have a knock-on effect to. Absolutely. I use the concept of the cave person brain with my patients, which is about as neuroanatomical as I get because I almost failed neuroanatomy in medical school, um, as a reference to the part of our brain that runs us as a mammal 
without any conscious intervention. It's the part that regulates our temperature and our, you know, metabolism, our digestion, all of the the elements of our bodies we can't consciously control. What I tell my patients is this cave person part of our brain has evolved exquisitely over the millennia to save us from death by starvation. That's the only reason the human race is possibly alive because we evolved much more during a time of want than of plenty. So this part of our brain is exquisitely attuned to malnutrition. And I always pause and say, malnutrition means when for any period of time, your body is not getting the energy intake that it needs regardless of what body shape or size you happen to be in. Malnutrition does not refer to someone with a visibly emaciated body or who's lost weight. So when the brain senses even a day or two of malnutrition, it jumps into action. It says, oh, I've got you. Our magnificent, beautiful, miraculous brains do what they were evolved to do. And they begin profoundly changing our body's physiology to save us from famine. Because that's all the brain understands. It doesn't understand it's a diet, it's a fast, it's a cleanse, it's an eating disorder. It just knows its mammal is being underfed. And as a result, the brain changes physical processes in the body to use less energy and get you through the famine. Now, everyone's body is going to do this differently in the sense that one person in the face of malnutrition might get cold hands and feet and low energy, but their heart rate's always normal and their tummy works fine. Another person might instantly develop constipation and bloating, but their heart rate is fine and their hands are warm. You know, exactly what turns on or turns off in the body is really related to our individual genetics. But here's sort of a quick list of the things that the brain may alter in order to save energy in someone who's not taking in enough. They may slow the heart. That's what happens to bears in the winter when they hibernate. And that slowed heartbeat is as a result of increased vagal tone in order to save calories. Now that same person with a slowed heartbeat at rest, when they walk down the hall, their heart rate may actually get quite a lot faster, which is the difference between someone with an athletic heart and someone with a starved heart. Because a great athlete who's well-nourished and well-rested may have a slower heart rate at rest. And then just walking down the hall, I mean, that's nothing for an athlete's heart who's well-rested and nourished. Heart rate's not going to change much. But somebody who's malnourished, regardless of body size or shape, may have a low heart rate at rest to save calories. And then as that malnourished body asks something of itself walking down the hall, even if the person is an over-exerciser, the heart rate may really go up. Say it goes from, you know, 45 or 55 up to 90. That's a very considerable change. That's a starving person's heart. Another example would be slowed digestion, which can result in gastroparesis or stomach emptying, constipation, bloating, abdominal pain. That in turn can trigger any number of other complications like bacterial overgrowth. People's hands, feet, and overall body temperature gets cool because the body doesn't want to spare those extra calories on keeping your body warm. So it makes you feel cold. So you seek a sweater and a hot cup of tea rather than make it keep your body temperature up. It also changes sex hormone production. And you've talked a ton about that before. It can result, but not necessarily, in the absence of menstrual periods for women and in the absence of erectile function normally for men. So there's a lot of different ways in which the body can change in response to malnutrition. It's just a question of your genetics as far as which ones you'll manifest. Yeah. And I think that's a really important thing for people to get for for a number of reasons. Like A, we have this stereotype of what like quote unquote an anorexic looks like. And that is really damaging because it means that 
for the very small percentage of people who fit that stereotype, they're going to be more likely to get help. And then for everyone else, it just doesn't work that way. And their disordered eating behaviors are often congratulated as, wow, this is the thing that you need to do to try and fit into society's body um, or body uh, preferences and so yeah it's a it's a real problem from from that side but also i mean I, i've talked more recently about like red s and mm -hmm. where the focus was so much for the female athlete triad on people having issues with their bones and then losing their period and what we know now is like that's just not what happens with everyone and so for a lot of people they would be completely missed because for whatever genetic reasons even under starvation their bones stayed relatively good and they were able to um, keep their periods uh, that's completely right and and it can mess with people on either side of the equation my patients who say you know gosh uh i used to be able to do a lot more of my eating disorder without my body falling apart but now i can't it's frustrating to me also on the other side of the spectrum are the people who say man i've been doing this a long time and my body seems to be really hanging in there and not really showing that much medical problems. That's frustrating to me. So either way, there's no winning. It's yeah. a matter of really understanding an individual's personal body responses, naming them as emerging from the eating disorder and as oftentimes being reversible with nutritional rehabilitation with or without weight gain, depending on the eating disorder. And and then being able to live their values better. Yeah, yeah. I think definitely coming back to that values piece because it's like, okay, even if for some miracle reason your body doesn't appear to be falling apart, even though maybe behind the scenes it really is, is this the life that you really want to be having? Like, is this allowing you to be with friends the way that you want to be or be with your kids or to be having relationships or to be able to eat in the way that you would truly want to be, to be eating? And as you said, like match that back up to values. Totally. Um, and so I, I made reference there to um, the, the female athlete triad and, and bone density and, and that not being so great for people who are uh, restricting or with eating disorders. And there was a bit in the book that I didn't really know about in terms of how someone's, uh, it was either Z scores or T scores will differ if they're an athlete versus not an mm. athlete with um, an eating disorder. So can you just talk about that? Because that wasn't something I'd, I'd heard of before. Oh, great. Yeah, absolutely. So when we do the bone density scan, uh, called a DEXA scan, we get two different types of scores back depending on people's ages. For those over 50, it's a T score. For those under 50, it's a Z score. And we, a lot of patients who are under 50, and I used to do this wrong too, but now I've got the right of it, mistakenly go around thinking they've got a diagnosis of osteopenia, which is sort of the intermediate diagnosis between normal bones and osteoporosis. However, formally speaking, osteopenia does not exist as a diagnosis for those under 50. It's only for those 50 and up. So then we really have to burrow in and say what harm is done by medical systems that lack a recognition of eating disorder physiology and the fact that you have to put the patient's narrative story and whole body picture together with the bone density results to get the proper diagnosis. And this is what I mean. In somebody under 50, I'm just going to focus on that population exclusively for a moment, a Z score of less than negative two of, of let, sorry of negative two or worse uh, equals a diagnosis called low bone density for age. That means that any diagnosis, any Z score greater than negative two, it's an awkward scoring system, are are listed on their sheet from the radiologist normal bone density for age. Now a lot of patients think, oh. Well, great. I guess I'm fine, you know. But here's the interesting trick. Less than negative two on the Z-score in addition to a history 
of low sex hormones as evidenced by either a low testosterone score or erectile dysfunction in a male or absent or irregular periods or low estradiol level in a female equals osteoporosis. That makes the diagnosis. You have to know the patient's whole story because those are what's called a secondary cause of osteoporosis, having those low sex hormone levels. And malnutrition itself definitely prevents bone formation normally. So if I've got anyone who has a Z score of negative two or lower and they have a history of an eating disorder, especially with this history of hormone imbalance at any point in the past, they don't just have quote unquote low bone density for age. They have osteoporosis. Yeah. And as a result of that diagnosis, we may need to treat them more um, sort of emphatically or more aggressively. Now, what's really interesting and what you referred to is that the International Olympic Committee or IOC has identified that young athletes under 50 should have better bones than we mere mortals because the act of exercising puts electro strain on the bones that signals to them, hey, we're under heavy use, become stronger. So a really good athlete, really sort of anyone who's athletic under 50, should have 5 to 15% stronger bone density than their age-matched peers. Thus, let's say that I've got somebody who's under 50, and many of my patients, by no means all, but many of them have an athletic past. If their Z-score is negative one or less, that reflects meaningful bone density loss. And so there's a lot of folks out there who have a negative 1.3 their, their test came up normal bone density. Their GP said, gosh, good news. Your bone density is normal. And we missed the opportunity to name it, diagnose it, and treat it in order to prevent bad complications down the road. Yeah. And I think that's a really important thing to know. And it's definitely going to be something that I will be looking out for um, because so many of the clients that I work with who have issues around food also have issues around exercise like I, if I'm thinking of the client population I I end up working with I would say 80 to 90 percent have um over exercise as part of their as part of their picture absolutely yeah and so one of the other things I I wanted to talk about um was just care I mean you, you made reference there to like clients who are under 50 and then over 50. So how much of your population that you're working with would be over 50 or what would be considered uh, older for having an eating disorder? I don't know like, what the cutoff is for, for someone to be younger or older with an eating disorder. Is, is there an agreed upon cutoff? There isn't. And it's a great question. And you're right. They, they deserve their own focus because they have a lot not in common with the younger patients. Um, you know, eating disorders in adults who are older, let's say over 40, over 50, are really, really common. We know that the gender and body image study confirmed really a high prevalence of chronic use of weight loss strategies, body dysmorphias, and a really close connection between emotional distress in body perceptions in women over 50 years old. On the whole, eating disorder prevalences in women over 40 is estimated at 3% and in men at 1% to 2%. Certainly at my former program, a quarter of the patients were over 40 and over 40% we're 30 and up. Um, in my current practice, I see patients from all over the weight spectrum, from pre-adolescence all the way into their 70s. Um, and I think it's really important to say that while there might be slightly different expectations of recovery rates or even sort of what recovery might be allowed to look like 
between the patient's own um, sort of stated goals and toleration and what the team feels, hey, you know, yes, at least that will keep you from dying. That's better than than nothing. Um, it's really an important message to say that anyone at any age can get relief from their eating disorder and can meaningfully improve and fully recover. Yeah. And I would, I want to second that as well. And so with the, the clients or the patients that you have who are in their forties or fifties or sixties, is it typically that that actually has been going on since they were in their teens or there's been some life events later on that's then uh, meant that they've started to, to diet and then end up down the, the eating disorder end of the spectrum? You know, the literature would indicate that most people with eating disorders in their 40s and up had some body stuff probably going on during adolescence, during the commonest inception years of an eating disorder. But I have a number of patients who, you know, say, well, I mean, I guess I was influenced to the extent that all of my peer group were somewhat influenced, but really my eating disorder didn't begin full blown until this particular time of life transition. And I think especially with regards to the narratives of women with eating disorders, and I suspect this is true of men too, I just don't have quite as much personal experience. It is those times of life transitions. It's graduations, marriages, divorces, menopause, children moving out of the house, um, illness in a parent, illness in a child, which can be the flint off which that spark of the eating disorder is struck. Sure. And the flint that it struck because those are times that will typically lead to either intentional or unintentional um, restriction or this is how people are then starting to use uh, this is a coping mechanism or, or a combination of, of both? A combination of both indeed sounds right. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, typically. I, I mean, I do, I, especially for people who have had eating disorders, the, the unintentional relapse is really something I'm uh, kind of that I talk with clients about and I mm. watch out for because it is so common where people are at a point in recovery where they're like so strong in the fact that I do not ever want to go back to that place. I, I really am striving to get to that values driven place that I want to get to. I'm I'm so close. And then a son will get sick or there'll be this thing that happens with their mother or like something will just throw them off where for whatever reason just food couldn't have been their priority or wasn't their priority as much as um, it's been more recently and that happens for a number of weeks or a month or whatever. And then before they know it, they're like, wow, I am now back in this place. I think that's such an important point you make, especially because that same tendency to underrate the importance of sort of the moment that somebody finds themselves in and relapse can be worsened by saying, but this time I don't want to. This yeah. time it's not like I have a drive for thinness. This time it's not like I want to be purging and and sort of getting that high and that release. Um, I don't even want it anymore, not like X number of years ago. So it can't be that bad, right? And you say, no, once again, your body doesn't know the difference. Yeah. And we risk reawakening those very same gremlins you say aren't present just by your beginning to have inadvertent vomiting because you've been really anxious or inadvertent weight loss because your IBS has been acting up. And even if you don't want it, unless you are aggressively going after solutions to, you know, make sure you get enough nutrition, et cetera, we risk tumbling all the way down to the bottom of the chutes and ladders board. Yeah, definitely. And what I have found with clients is if they then can catch it and then they put in the, the work to get back, the recovery process there is much, much quicker. And so it's yes. not like, okay, we're starting from, from all the beginning again. Um, but there is, there, it is very, 
uh, amazing how quickly someone can can get back to that place of of um, being in in an eating disorder when there was just no intention of of trying to get there. One hundred percent agree. Yeah, um, and so with your older. Um, clients then, and I'm, I'm not using the word older as a, <laughs> pejoratively, but just as, as a descriptor of like, is there things that are different with them in terms of how you would work with them versus someone who is younger? Yeah, there's a number of differences if they wish there to be differences. I think I should qualify. So okay. um, let's say that I have a, an 18-year-old individual versus a 42-year-old individual who comes to me with a similar level of anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa and um, or, or binge eating disorder, any of them. And I will say uh, pretty clearly that with the 18-year-old that outpatient team and I are going to have pretty clear expectations of momentum, forward progress, behavioral reduction, really aiming for complete wellness and recovery as quickly as possible because the less amount of time that beautiful brain is exposed to malnutrition, the better. Yep. And I'm going to use the term malnutrition across the eating disorders because we know that every single one of the eating disorder diagnoses can come with a meaningful element of caloric restriction. Um, then when it comes to the 42-year-old, let's say they often, not always, have been sick longer. They've been through a lot. They've sacrificed a lot already. And they might say, you know, Dr. G, here's my values. But um, I'm just not sure how I can get there. It feels so daunting. And then, you know, as we sort of get to know each other, I might suggest a slower pathway towards wellness. If that's what the individual can tolerate, I might suggest harm reduction outcomes where the individual says, look, you know, I think I could probably commit to nourishing myself enough on a daily basis to meet my needs and maybe to to gain some weight if it's uh, anorexia nervosa. But um, I, I cannot commit to do more than that, at least now. In that person, I would be much more likely to say, okay, let's start there and let's see how you go from there. Now, if the person says, Dr. G, I'm ready to get better. I want to get all the way better. I want it to be fast. I, I, I hate this. Great. You know, I'm in. Um, but I think that one must be a little more gentle and compassionate. And really, you know, I've had to work on my own distress tolerance because I absolutely adore each one of my patients and watching them struggle and suffer physically and emotionally is sad, but it's not about my struggle. If I need to do that work, I can do it elsewhere. It's about my holding a space to provide really thoughtful, informed medical evaluations and to be sort of a quarterback of a treatment team so that their dietitian and their therapist feel comfortable saying, all right, let's go slowly. Let's go slowly and see if we can inch you back towards what you say matters. Because I think a lot of individuals, especially if they're younger in the field, might think, oh, you know, if, if I allow this person to go slowly, I'm just colluding with their eating disorder. When the answer is we've actually got to move away from that sort of hierarchical parochial structure of this is what recovery looks like and be creative and meet patients where they are and try to find a way forward that's creative. Yeah. And it, so are you saying that there there is less of that when you're working with someone younger where you feel like, okay, I, I feel like I can push this a little more or they should have slightly uh, quicker trajectory? Yeah. In my younger patients, I'm going to push for clearer um, outcomes-based recovery work um, because it's they're relatively newer to the disease and the faster we can get their brain nourished, the likelier that they will end up in a meaningful remission from their eating disorder. Um, but even then it takes creativity and, um, I have really come to learn. It's been a, a humbling and, and also an exhilarating process in the course of running this clinic for me to realize that, you know, it is actually 
the rarer patient who sort of meets all their benchmarks right on time and proceeds linearly without backtracking. It's sloppy. Yep. It is messy and hard and things happen and our patients are already perfectionists. So if I can help guide them and walk with them and sort of set a, a pace, but meet them when they trip and, and help them up if they slow down, to me, that's the sort of relationship that induces trust and that can help allow patients to give up the behaviors that have seemed absolutely necessary to hold on to. Yeah, definitely. And I, I mean, I would agree with everything you've said there in terms of, I think with time, with doing this with more and more people, I've, yeah, I've learned that, that things are really messy. And I think sometimes there can be, if things aren't going to plan or aren't going as well as I, I had hoped, there would be some ego of mine getting in the way of like, oh, I ne- I'm obviously doing something wrong. Maybe I need to be doing this better. What, what, what more can I read? And, and all of those things can definitely be true. But there's also just a you know what, things just don't always look like the nice, neat, linear things are getting better uh, that that you would imagine. And so, yeah, I've definitely adopted more of a, like, if things are at least trending in the right direction, then, then we are good here. And just trying to find ways of keeping that person to be progressive. And, and even when there are times where things slip back or things don't go as we'd hoped like how can that be a learning experience so Mm. it's like okay cool next time this thing arises we know we've been through it before you know you can do this thing or that thing made it much worse like if the whole journey can just be further understanding their reactions their body their perceptions etc then then it is still moving in the right direction I love that. You and I are completely aligned on that. And I do think that it takes practitioner um, maturity and practitioners doing their own work, whether that's casually with their teammates or their colleagues or more formally in supervision, to really exorcise the demons of our own perfectionism, our own imposter syndrome. There's plenty of times that one of my patients is struggling and I have this moment of thinking to myself, uh, you're supposed to be Dr. Gaudiani. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're supposed to be able to make this better. Um, that's why they're paying you. That's why they're here to see you. And then I just have to really, like you said, check myself and say, look, I'll be really introspective and think about what I could do better personally and realize that there is no alternative universe in which the optimal doctor is giving the optimal sentence at the optimal moment and the patient's able to respond to it and move forward necessarily. We're just all sort of muddling through together. It can be agonizing for parents, especially to watch their kids have this sort of halting, starting, stopping, regressing, slipping, moving forward pathway because so much feels like it's at stake. But indeed, that is the nature of eating disorder recovery. Yeah. And I think like partly it's it's freeing to to come to that realization as as the practitioner, but I also think it makes me a better practitioner because it it means that I don't feel like I have to constantly be pushing and it doesn't set us up as adversaries when things mm-hmm. aren't going the way that it should. You can then be much better at walking with that person and seeing the struggles and, and being okay with it without feeling like I'm the responsible person for this. I love that. And and that reminds me that the way that you're practicing, the way I'm trying to practice really does hew away from the patriarchal I'm in charge. I'm the expert. You'll do as I say, and then we'll know what's gone right. That is just, (laughs) there is not actually a role for that mentality in there. Unfortunately, that remains, even when it's done in a pleasant way, a lot of what Western medicine is sort of grounded on still. Yeah, definitely. And look, maybe there is some level of a role for that as a, like in an inpatient place where you're like, okay, this is life and death. Like you, you need to do this. But in terms of the clients that we're working with, it just doesn't work. Completely agree. What about in terms of the population you're seeing, how many are, are, um, identifying as males? 
You know, in my prior practice, we had about 10% of our patient population were males. It just so happens by, I think, selection bias accidentally, and I've got, you know, we're still only three years in, I've got fewer than that uh, male patients now. But I think that that probably speaks to ongoing stigma in society around identification, diagnosis, and treatment of men of all body shapes and size across all of the eating disorders because they are out there. They're being missed. In fact, they're being praised for their, uh, you know, um, orthorexic eating habits and their intensive workout regimens. They continue to suffer from constructs of toxic masculinity and what maleness is supposed to be like. Um, they suffer just as much as the rest of people do from those, um, societal constructs. Yeah. And so do you feel like, I don't know, in the next five or 10 years as things shift that there, we're going to have this real um, big increase in male eating disorders and it not being an increase, but just it's going to be identified? I hope so because they're out there and they think they're living healthily until it becomes obvious that things aren't going so hot. But, um, you know, we've got a, a good friend in the field who is recovered from an eating disorder and is a former elite athlete. He has expressed that he thinks the vast majority of the guys he played um, collegiate and professional sports with have disordered eating or frank eating disorders, all under the guise of let's get an edge what can we do to decrease our body fat X amount? What can we cut out of our diets to, to give us the edge as we play? The irony being, of course, that as they speak amongst themselves and draw from media reports of what bizarre diet so-and-so follows, they're actually not nourishing their bodies. They're ending up in REDS, relative energy deficiency in sport, or a florid eating disorder because, once again, our cave person brains will respond in knowable ways to inadequate fueling. Yeah. And I, I, I was chatting with Aaron Flores around this mm. um, in a recent podcast. It hasn't been released at, at the point at which we're recording this. And just I was saying how much it then just gets changed in terms of the language. So rather than it being talking about dieting, it's talking about like biohacking and, and <laughs> it just, it, it gets shifted into, into something else that becomes really glorified. And then when you just really strip it all back, you're like, no, you, this is just eating disorders. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. And I think always asking ourselves the question, who stands to benefit for making you feel bad about your body and maintaining the systems of oppression that broadly speaking, keep you quiet. You know, and when you sort of elevate your, your brain to that level, it becomes less about an individual sort of, do they have good enough self-esteem? Do they have enough body love? Do they have enough bootstrap, you know, just go get them individually. Really, we're all tucked within the intersections of various systems that try to keep us quiet, try to keep us insecure, try to keep us buying products. Um, and that's always so important to keep in mind. And that absolutely affects people of all genders. Yeah, definitely. And with the the men that you were either seeing at the the place the, the previous place you're working or at the at your current place um is there anything different in terms of how you work with men versus how you work with women or there there are different things that affect men differently uh whether that be from a, a physiological perspective or or some other way yeah i think there's a few things that i certainly think about um one of them is that there should be no assumptions that the driving force or the sort of, if not the eating disorder, then dot, 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 what fills in the dot, dot, dot for men may be quite different than for women. It may be similar, but, you know, um, where there may be a drive for overall thinness in women patients, there may be more of a drive for muscularity and leanness in men. Um, and, you know, they're, they're being influenced and pressured 
in different ways by society. We always have to keep that in mind. And I, again, that's why I try to really hear my patient's perspective before I imagine upon them what might be going on. Additionally, a lot of men are not appropriately worked up for for low testosterone levels or for bone density um, problems. And, uh, you know, I don't know whether that's because of provider lack of knowledge, because men don't happen to have periods to make providers think about sex hormones in them. But for every one of my male patients, I talk about erectile function. You know, when it comes to dieting, a lot of with or without weight loss, m- many of my patients can remember sort of the week that their erectile dysfunction occurred, you know, and they're like, oh, yep, nope, things stopped working right around uh, six weeks ago or stopped working normally. And so having frank, open, un, you know, embarrassed conversations about these vital topics is important. And then checking free testosterone levels, two different morning checks before 10 a.m. are what's required in the U.S., two weeks apart, for insurance to agree yeah, you know, this guy does have clinical low testosterone levels that require replacement. Because as with females, absence of sex hormones in males causes more bone resorption. That is the natural process by which our bones are turned over. Bones are always being, a little bit's being made, a little bit's being taken away. When you don't have sex hormones, more is taken away. And then when you're not nourishing yourself properly, you're not making enough bone. So I've seen individuals who, you know, should have been the slam dunk obvious, you know, classic anorexia nervosa for 10 years in and out of programs. And the guy's never had a bone density ordered for him ever. And you check it and it's like, oh my gosh, what a disaster. We have 10 years of bone density loss that could have been prevented with appropriate use of testosterone or other medications. Wow. And how reliable is looking at you know, morning erections for, for men as a, as a proxy for, high or, uh, for, for low testosterone? You know, sexual function comes in a bell curve. So I think it's asking men to compare their own previous function to their function while undernourished and over moving. Um, and you know, it's not sort of a standard for all it's like compared with you normally, how's your sex drive? How's your sexual function? Um, and a lot of guys are, are really quite attuned to that. Yeah. One of the big things that you talk about in the book, um, that I really like you to talk about today is like weight stigma and binge eating disorder and the problem that it causes. I would love to, um, So, you know, I, perhaps in another edition of the book, I will separate out those two categories because it is very important people hear me say that not everyone with binge eating disorder is in a larger body and not everyone in a larger body has binge eating disorder. Um, However, I, I do talk about them in the same section of the book because there can be overlap there. But by the same token, I have tons of patients who have anorexia nervosa that I hate to call atypical anorexia nervosa because the weight stigma of the DSM-5 is so just ridiculously obvious in that diagnosis. Um, But, you know, that's anorexia nervosa that occurs in people who don't happen to be visibly malnourished, visibly emaciated. Um, But there's plenty of my patients uh, presently and, you know millions more, unfortunately, who have anorexia nervosa and who live in larger bodies or body sizes, you know, constructed as normal. Um, By the same token, I think that when I talk about binge eating disorder, certainly it can result in higher body weights. And so those individuals experience stigma. Probably the best thing that I can say is that when I talk about weight stigma, I'm referring to a, a... a reality that influences and affects not only my patients in larger bodies, regardless of diagnosis, but also my patients who are in more emaciated bodies, because everyone in society is aware that thinness is preferable and holds power. That's not saying 
in any way. That is my personal belief, but that is what is foisted upon us by everything from media to commercial business to medical practitioners. So many patients are harmed by this dangerous, gross exaggeration. Um, It is just a non-scientific uh, reality. It's a way of society to segregate itself and to make sure that some people have less power. So I think a lot about weight stigma. I think a lot about internalized size stigma, that that innate experience all of us have within us that sort of has been inculcated to believe this and that we have to identify and fight against as we provide care. This, for instance, would be the kind of thing that would require, what would make me, when one of my patients with anorexia nervosa would be, you know, really anxious about gaining too much weight. In the past, I might've said, don't worry, you're not going to get fat. Oops. Nope, that's not what we say because I don't know what's going to happen with your body. And my saying that implies that I think that there is something negative about fatness as a descriptor. So, you know, we always have to be looking at this in ourselves. Um, The reality is that people in larger bodies experience profound stigma in medical settings. They are continually being asked to lose weight with regards to things that they present to their GP for that have absolutely nothing to do with weight. They are underdiagnosed. They are under offered really nice modalities that help like physical therapy when it comes to say knee pain. Um, they are shamed and ultimately they are ostracized from a sense of comfort that they can reach out and connect comfortably with their medical provider. Uh, I personally believe that the number one medical uh, problem associated with being in a larger body is the inadequate and often harmful medical and surgical care offered to those individuals. Yeah. And were you... Was there any of this taught to you at medical school? Like, was was there anything mentioned about weight stigma as being um, a thing? Not even a sentence. And I mean, not even a sentence in my prior program either. You know, this is really, I'm sorry to say, learnings that I have finally come to in the last three years. And now I am all on board. Yeah. And was this like basically health at every size and weight stigma yeah. came to you as a, as a package. It did. It did. I mean, I was aware, uh, sort of at a, at a, at a high level, obviously of a sort of body pressures and this and that, but constructs of social justice as they intersect with medical care, especially of those with eating disorders, uh, really are newer for me. And, um, and yet now part of the fiber of my soul. Yeah. And so is part of the connection as well between the the weight stigma and and more with binge eating disorder, if binge eating disorder happens uh, proportionally more likely with people in a higher weight body because they're in a higher weight body, they're then told to do things to lower their weight to quote unquote help their health. They then go on said diet or restriction, which then makes it much more likely that they end up binging and then you're then in that position. Most definitely. I mean, there's no doubt that one of the brain changes that occurs due to cave person brain is that when we restrict food, our brain clicks into a frantic fantasy of the food that we need and that we're denying ourselves. And that type of a mammal that is starved is not playful, creative, or cuddly. It is rigid rule bound and anxious because it is seeking food. Um, and invariably people who restrict certain food groups absent a true allergy, like say carbohydrates, which is one of the most absurd food groups one can skip, um, become somewhat obsessed with them. That's not because there's a quote unquote addiction to sugar or carbs that, that doesn't exist. It's because they are, you know, 
being driven by their cave person brain to go seek out the thing that they're lacking. And when they have access to it, like, oh, I guess I'll have something, they go straight to the bottom of the box because, you know, that's what their body has been yearning and that's how we save ourselves from starvation. If you're in the desert and then you come to a little patch of woods and you find a honey hive, you're not going to be like, "Mm, that's a nice little taste of honey. Okay, on we go. You are going to eat the whole damn honey hive, you know, and that is not like willpower. That is biology, friends. Yeah, and this is the problem because what gets mislabeled is that the binging is the issue and I'm always when I'm when talking to people about this I'm like no the binging is a symptom that the restriction is the issue 100% if there wasn't the restriction you're most likely not going to end up at that binge stage but that's just not what is typically told to them they think oh I'm at this higher weight because I'm binging so that must be the problem and there is just this misfocus with what they should be doing as a as a way of remedying it exactly right exactly right people think you know I've I've got a problem with with willpower with control etc if I could just rein that in I'd be all right and the answer is no my love you are controlling everything far too much if you you know order your favorite binge food and have it for supper and have the leftovers for lunch next day, you know, and you're much less likely to eat five servings of it. Um, You're more likely to enjoy exactly what you want of it and realize there's more tomorrow, no restriction, you have access to it. No food has a higher moral valence than another. So I I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, I guess the, the difficulty is with that is because in the beginning they they almost proved the point of like, but when I bring in these foods, I eat more of them. And so the food is really the problem. And it's like, no, like, yes, it feels like that at this point, but with time that is going to change. Um, but it can be difficult in that very short term place because it feels like, no, I, I'm, I'm really proving why I, I need to uh, avoid these foods. Exactly. Um, and so another one I want to talk about is is orthorexia and, and just how common this is with your clients because it, it feels like, and I don't know if this is really the case or the, the media has just moved on, like uh, for, for three, four, five years there was this real focus on clean eating and that seems mm. to have disappeared and at the time when the clean eating movement was going on and then there was a lot of backlash around it, there was talk around this is leading to orthorexia and what orthorexia is about. And I just don't seem to be seeing articles like that in the same way. So I'm, I'm just wanting to get your sort of reading on, on what you're noticing. My fear is that it's because orthorexia, which does not yet exist as a DSM diagnosis, but is well defined as an obsession with healthy or clean eating with a series of arbitrary rules that differ from one orthorexic to another. Um, My fear is that that kind of eating is actually no longer being highlighted as being a gateway to more significant malnourishment, vitamin deficiency, uh, poor athletic performance, it's just become what people think is the right way to eat. Um, I was in an interesting email correspondence with a colleague who said that um, a, a mom in her spiritual congregation recently told her daughter, you know, we would never eat pasta in this household because that is just so unhealthy. Who would ever eat pasta? Surely no one does. You know, and I mean, that that's just like jaw droppingly horrifying to me. Um, yeah. A as an Italian, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and and B as somebody who personally loves and frequently eats pasta, and C as just it, it's sort of just spellbindingly crappy nutritional advice. We need carbs and lots of them to fuel our bodies because they're the only things nutritionally that can be broken down to the glucose that runs our brain. It's like putting something in a car that might make the tires turn, but doesn't actually make the engine start and being like, I wonder why this engine is so messed up. I'm putting plenty of tire juice in this car. Um, So, you know, this is... Uh, a huge problem. I actually think it's not that it's gone away. I think that everyone has absorbed it as a norm, (laughs) that carbs are bad, that sugar is evil, um, 
that, uh, gosh, I mean, there's a million to name, that preservatives will ruin us all. I, I can't say enough that I am an omnivore who, you know, constantly preaches to my patients and then encourages them to talk to their dietitian about the details, eat all the things, eat plenty of them, eat the things that satisfy, eat the things that will make sure to give you the energy you need to do what you're doing. And that's pretty much it. You know, I obviously, oh, well, maybe not obviously, I always get trolled when I talk about Hayes or weight inclusive care in sort of broader uh, news types of things. Um, and people say, what, you should just eat junk food all day and that doesn't matter? Well, no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it just means that there's no moral valence to any given food. And of course, nice fresh fruits and vegetables are a lovely part of getting in the vitamins and minerals you want and all the other things too. Yeah. I, I remember when I wrote an article about this years ago where people, the, the response was like, oh, but so you're now telling me eating healthy is is not the right thing to do? And I'm like, <laughs> you, you're missing the point. And yes. the analogy I used was like, there's a difference between washing your hands and washing your hands five hours a day because you have OCD. We don't oh, look at the person oh, who, great. who washes their hands for five hours and thinks, oh, they're just like the epitome of cleanliness. We're like, no, this is now a problem. It's no longer serving them. It's creating a real issue. And I think the same way about orthorexia. It's not that healthy eating is bad. It's you've taken it to a place where it's actually not healthy at all. Like we're missing the context and we're, we're thinking, oh, these foods are healthy, but how it is being constructed and put together and how someone is then thinking about the, the food is leading them to not a healthy place. I love that metaphor and with gratitude, I will use it. Okay, definitely. I mean, the other part of it as well is I think orthorexia feels like it came into prominence while the clean eating movement was going on. And so it's it's become brushed with the stereotype of what we thought of as clean eating back in 2014, 2015, etc. So we would think of someone orthorexic when they're spiralizing courgettes or, or whatever, <laughs> but it could be just as much you're orthorexic if you're following carnivore, even though that doesn't present in the same way as we thought of as orthorexia. Correct. Yeah, I think anything that has to do with hewing rigidly to an arbitrary set of rules that if you follow them, you feel a sense of um, sort of higher purpose or um, superiority uh, or moral, you know, win. Any of those are orthorexia. It's not just the rabbit eaters that is those who eat like rabbits. It's those who eat in any weird way in which if you say, hey, honey, let's go out for date night, the person would immediately freeze and be horrified at the prospect of what their options would be. Yeah. Um, and one other area was uh, that you mentioned in your book that I wanted to touch on as well was like substance abuse and eating disorders and, and the overlap between these two so yeah, tell me like in terms of the clients you're seeing, how often is that occurring? Very highly. There is tremendous overlap between substance use disorder and eating disorders. Um, and unfortunately, these are some of the patients that get, I, I think, the most missed, although I've got a pretty long list of people who get missed, <laughs> um, because it's very hard to treat one and not risk symptom substitution with the other. And um, that's particularly true in higher levels of care. Um, so somebody is, you know, in day treatment for their eating disorder, they're now nourishing, they're not purging, but woo, look at that. Their alcoholism really kicks in again. Or you have somebody who enters substance use treatment they're now clean from drugs, but they're able to get away with eating disorder behaviors because it looks like how everyone else is talking about wanting to eat. And so they're flying below the radar. Um, there's also a lot more treatment withdrawal and sort of early termination of treatment from eating disorder care of those who have substance use disorder. So 
it's tremendously hard and it requires really a multidisciplinary team um, and, and a lot of attention to both at the same time. And I think it might be also difficult as well because you're getting mixed messages from the ways that you deal with them. So from a, a substance uh, perspective, I would imagine it's much more of an abstinence model. Okay, you've got to stop having these things and stop having them for the rest of your life. And with food, you're kind of trying to encourage the opposite in terms of like real a real openness. And so there there might be those mixed messages of like, oh, but then I'm going to turn into a sugar addict or yeah. um and so it's this uh, these these approaches where you're kind of going in in different ways and talking about things differently, even though the substances that that they may think of, or well, there aren't these things the same. Uh, that's exactly right. I also think the ethos of the substance use treatment world, of course, which I'm not nearly as well versed in as the eating disorder world, oftentimes mistakenly recommends orthorexic behaviors like, hey, in this sobriety house, we're also sugar free, you know, or we're also white flour free. Let's get all of the bad substances out of your life. And unfortunately that, you know, A is scientifically incorrect. B is going to trigger binge eating and C is going to radically contribute to eating disorder behaviors and perpetuate those myths. Yeah. And I guess also if I'm thinking along those um, the lines of like OA, so Overeaters Anonymous follows very much the same principles as Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm I'm yet to have a conversation with someone who's adopted the OA model where it's genuinely worked for them. It just it, it just doesn't seem to do what it does for alcohol. That's exactly right, because it can't, because that's not how our brains are set up. You know, our brains are set up perfectly well to be sober from alcohol and drugs. Great. We didn't, you know, uh, evolve to seek those out and make sure that we had them at all times, but we sure as shit did for carbohydrates. So we've got to really remember how our brains are biologically set up and really try to thread that needle very delicately with a full abstinence model with regards to the substance in question and supporting our sensitive, lovely patients around how frustrating it is that some can use in moderation without problems and they cannot, um, as well as giving the message of, you know, sort of moderation and all inclusivity with regards to how they subsequently eat. And with the substance abuse that you're seeing, is, is it mostly alcohol? Is it prescription drugs? Like what, what are the things that are, that are most commonly coming up? For me, I have most seen cannabis and alcohol, but um, a good study of women with anorexia nervosa looked at different sort of drugs of abuse. And um, in the in the anorexia with purging group, the risk for drug abuse or dependence was six times higher than with restrictive anorexia. Um, in that particular group, actually 32% of those with anorexia nervosa purging subtype also had drug use or dependence. Cannabis was the most commonly used drugs. However, stimulants, cocaine, sedatives, um, and alcohol were all studied and were quite common too. And with that research, do, do you think a lot of that then can come down to temperaments that can then lead to where someone ends up in terms of what, what type of eating disorder they, they end up with? Yeah, I think that's probably right. I think that there, you know, broadly speaking, there are temperamental um, subtleties, uh, differences amongst those who purge, for instance, versus those who never purge. Um, and it, it does seem apparent from the literature and from my own clinical experience, I suspect yours as well, that those who purge seem to be more likely to be at risk for concurrent substance use disorder. Right. And with, I mean, we haven't had the change in laws over here around cannabis that, that has come into the US. So has that got better or worse just from your experience now that it's such more, so much more readily available? Yeah. I mean, here I sit in Denver, Colorado, where it's freely available and, uh, and quite legal. 
You know, I think my feeling around cannabis use is that by comparison with alcohol, there are probably fewer physiologic risks in some ways. Um, as long as someone is of age and and using moderately, that's always the the the, the big point, isn't it? Um, I have reservations and concerns about my uh, patients who are under 25 years old, which is well over the legal age, who are using cannabis regularly just because you know, some of the data we have about how that impacts brains, especially brains that already have a propensity to mental illness, is not great. But, you know, the, the jury is still out on that in, in in the greater scheme of things. On the whole, I would rather my patients nourish themselves, do great therapy, and consider well-overseen psychiatric medications than sort of self-medication, um, mainly because... I just want to make sure we're not muddying the waters about what's really going on. Yeah. But I am not a stickler by any means, and I've got plenty of my patients who who do regularly use marijuana. Okay. Well, look, Dr. G, is there anything that we haven't gone through that you really wanted to chat about today? It feels like we've touched a lot of different topics, but I just want to give you this opportunity in case there was something that we didn't go through. You know, I think the one thing that I'd love to talk about briefly is empowering kids and parents of kids around the time of adolescence, when they start going into the pediatrician's office and we start hearing some weight stigma comments come in like, oh gosh, you gained a lot of weight since last time. And I wonder if we could talk a little bit about that because I think I'd like to lend my medical credentials to some ways that we can reframe those sets of conversations, which can be so damaging to kids. Yeah. I'd love to hear about that. And just in terms of your own experience around this like do you you've got two girls is that is that right I do yeah I've got two daughters one okay. is 14 and the other is almost 11 at the time of this recording okay fine so is this also coming from experiences that that they've had or that you've noticed with them as well you know these the ones that I talk about with my patients that are quite prevalent haven't shown up in my kids pediatrician's office yet but the conversations that I have with my kids about changing bodies and about size and shape absolutely you know this is a topic of regular conversation in our household Okay, cool. So yeah, but by all means share share with people what you want to say around this. Thanks. Yeah, so it is necessary for kids to gain a ton of weight in order to successfully move from a child's body to an adult's body. And it is almost never the case that a child progresses through adolescence in perfect equipoise with not an awkward moment to be seen. You know, I mean, I, I would love to hear from one of your listeners for whom they were like, nope, nope. It was all really smooth sailing. No problem. There, there is um, no amount of money that could be offered to me to want to be a teenager again. <laughs> Exactly. So what we find now, though, in this sort of overly thin focused world is that from the ages of, depending on when puberty starts in your kid, say eight through 15, there are going to be years at, and maybe forever where your kid is going to have gone from a certain body type to a thicker body type. And they're going to have years where they gain weight a lot faster than they grow in height. It may be that that presages the fact that they are destined properly, healthily to be a bigger bodied person, in which case, great. The best thing a parent can do is not lament their fat child or worry that their kid is going to get teased and therefore engage in dieting talk in the home, but rather to sort of celebrate their kid's body and everything about it and to make home a safe place for all body types and to help prepare their child for what society, you know, may be slinging their way. Or it may be that a kid just goes through those thicker phases and higher weight gain as they prepare to enter their adult selves. What's commonly found is that a pediatrician will take a look at a growth chart and sort of make a comment. Uh oh, your weight's quite a lot up this time, or you know, I see you're thicker around the middle. Now we got to be really careful that that doesn't continue. Let's let's watch out on the sweets there. You know, these these 
I suppose, well-meaning, very common comments that then just strike a kid straight in the heart and set up, if they hadn't gotten any commentary already, a a, a real conundrum because that pediatrician has a lot of power. And when we speak about power in this moment, it can be very hard as a parent who, you know, where you rely on the pediatrician to prescribe the insulin or prescribe the asthma medicine or to take care of your other child to stand up and say, now, hey, doctor, I prefer you not speak that way to my child. That doesn't seem right. Yeah, that can be very difficult. So the first thing is to make sure that the parents and aunties and uncles and grandparents listening to this know how necessary and normal it is for kids' bodies to go through any number of awkward years or heavier years as they go through adolescence. And for some, that will be the body they occupy. And for others, it will sort out into, you know, proportions that are more familiar later on. Either of those are fine. What should not happen is familial comments about the body, teasing, differential eating patterns. Well, you can't have dessert tonight, but your sister can have ice cream. Um, or, Or any undue focus on this. And instead to say to kids, oh, your body is about to go through miraculous changes. It's not always going to be fun, but it's doing incredible work right now. And, you know, nobody knows exactly how they're going to be shaped during that time. In our family, we honor body diversity. And we also know that we eat what we want. We eat delicious foods. We eat to make sure that our taste buds are satisfied and that we have the energy we need to do the fun stuff we do in our life. Yeah. What I think is helpful is just briefly to talk to the, to the kid in advance of the pediatrician appointment and say, there is a chance that your pediatrician is going to make some silly comment about your weight. But you and I both know, because you know, I have educated myself on this, is that that has nothing to do with your health or wellness. And we understand, you know, because we listened to Chris, that that kind of talk doesn't help anybody. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, as you're saying all of these things, I'm reflecting on many of the clients that I've had and and their journey towards an eating disorder or disordered eating was because of the kind of interaction you're talking about. And then they had that interaction and that was the thing that made them make changes. And it was changes that they were then praised for and we're told that now they're looking after themselves or aren't you mm. good etc that then continued on and then spiraled and then they ended up in the place that they ended up in and so I, I think it's really important as you say to have that conversation beforehand but I, I I also see how difficult it is because of how many people just aren't on board with this message and how what can on the surface appear like, oh, this person's making some healthful changes can, can then just turn so nasty. That's absolutely right. Um, medical practitioners have not yet internalized the reality that health cannot be ascertained by appearance. Yeah. Period. Um, and you know, when I talk about this, I, I get pushback from some who say, okay, but Dr. G, what about if, you know, my kid is really gaining weight fast, has never been able to regulate their appetite and is, you know, having trouble breathing when they run and physical education now and is, you know, um, not able to do the things that they want to do. The answer remains, and this is sort of the core of how Hayes gets practiced by an internist, is that we do not focus on the weight and we do not recommend dieting. That behavioral change can absolutely occur when seeing a wonderful dietitian and a therapist around, gosh, you know, can you tell me what it is that makes you want to eat, feel hungry to eat fourth and fifth portions of, of dinner at night when, you know, you're actually sort of physically full, but you're driven to want to eat more. All right. Okay. Let's start from there. Let's work through that. It's never well, we're going to cut sweets. We're going to cut carbs. We're never going to eat this. We're never going to eat that because you and I both know, as we've talked the whole time, that is guaranteed to set off the cave person brain to cause a transient, maybe 
loss in weight, which will get roundly, you know, positive attention in society, which only contributes to the greater likelihood of body shame and an eating disorder ongoing, and then to greater weight gain afterwards. Because your cave person brain says, gosh, we've already gone through at least one desert. Yeah. We might be raising this human in a time of scarcity. So let's make sure that next time we come through this desert and we have access to food, that we push their body weight above whatever their prior set point was by some just to safety them for the next desert. That is how we are built. It is how we are wired. There is no way around it. So dieting can never be part of the solution. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think in the scenario that you just gave, what is kind of pushed upon someone is like the skill that you want to learn is weight loss. And, and for me, it's like, no, the meta skill you want to learn is how do you listen to your body? Oh, how do you yes. learn how to, how to listen to hunger and fullness? How do you listen to satisfaction? How can you start to work out how to structure your eating in a way that supports you? Like the, the meta skill should be about how to live and eat in a, in a healthful way in the, the kind of broader uh, definition of what that means, not in a sort of orthorexic way of what that means. Exactly. Yeah. So in terms of your, your daughters, is there any specific conversations that you're having with them or even when they were younger, were there other things that you were doing with them in terms of uh, books to read or, or resources that you were sharing with them? Well, you know, I, I have a lot of theories, but it'll take until they're um, a decade along to see if any of them were right. <laughs> um, they come loaded for bear as far as their genetic predisposition towards eating disorders and the temperamental traits, of course. Um, and yet I am, you know, passionate about what I do and talk about it all the time and have really enjoyed inculcating in them um, my feminist perspectives on this, my um, social justice perspectives, and certainly my, my weight inclusive perspectives to the extent that if an ad is shown on TV where someone's talking about weight loss, they'll both be like, "Uh oh, mom's <laughs> going to freak out. Um, so, you know, they, they definitely get the message. Um, and they understand the messages about sort of the, the broader picture of avoiding orthorexic tendencies. I think that there are a couple of inflection points where, where one can be thoughtful about this. Um, a not talking about your own body or other people's, either really praisingly or negatively. Um, just don't don't say. <laughs> if you've got to talk about your body, go to your therapist, go to your dietitian and talk about it, but don't talk about it in the home. Oh, I'm so happy my body is X, Y, and Z, or oh, I've lost weight, or gosh, doesn't that person look strong or healthy? Nope. Like Just leave, leave bodies as sort of neutrality. Um, when I exercise, um, I've been really thoughtful since they were quite young to make sure that they heard me say, mommy's exercising so she can stay strong to play with you and really disconnect it from a body appearance, have it be a, a functional piece um, because movement has everything to do with ability and interest. And um, there's a lot of, of issues with how people are encouraged to move when that's not an option for them. Um, and I think talking through adolescence and talking through what's going to happen with their bodies, talking through, you know, just appropriate birds and bees topics can be really nicely done in not necessarily heteronorming ways, in ways that honor body diversity and imagine the the diversity of, of people and experiences out there. Um, and, and just, I think the way in which, the way in which we, we talk and, and ultimately, my, my belief is that children are going to be exposed chronically to the kind of societal ills we've talked about. We can't protect them from those, but we can, to a certain extent, inoculate them from some of the harms by making sure that home is a place where they can feel safe in their bodies and unconditionally loved and safe in their relationship to food. Yeah. And so, I mean, you, you are a good decade in advance of me in terms of your, your daughter. So I've got a, a two-year-old son. And so I think at, at this stage, mm -hmm. we, we've got a book called The Body Book, which we'll often read. And it talks about different shapes and all bodies being good. Um, and yeah, we're just very conscious of not talking about 
um, bodies and weight loss and, and, and everything you've, you've talked about there. And even when Ramsey will like grab Ali's tummy, um, just being conscious of, of what we say around that. And she'd be like, yeah, that was where you were. And, and just having this real neutrality around bodies or just um, being very uh, positive about uh, what they can do and and yeah just never never bad mouthing bodies or other people's bodies and and so yeah we we are very conscious of that even though he's he's only just becoming verbal and and mm, only two I love that I love that and I think you know we've got to be really cautious when kids say mom am I fat or mom are you fat take a breath because oftentimes the thing that people say is no honey you're beautiful whoops, you've just put fatness at opposition to beauty. And so instead, ask, answer questions with questions. Tell me what that means. Who's talking about fatness around you? Everybody has fat on them. That is for sure true. You know, things like that. So uh, I think that those are all important little, little messages one can give. Yeah. Well, look, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for, for all the time that we've, we've had today. Where can people be going to, to find out more about you? They can go to my website, www.gaudianiclinic.com. That's G-A-U-D-I-A-N-I clinic.com. And on our website, they can learn about what we do. They can see podcasts that I've done. There's a link to my book, which is also available, uh, you know, any online resources where people get books. Um, I would be delighted for them to take a peek. Perfect. Well, look, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and for, for everything you do. Uh, as I said, I really loved your book and I would recommend that people check it out. Chris, thank you so much for having me. So that is it for this week's show. As I mentioned at the top, Seven Health is again taking on new clients. Uh, we specialize in helping clients overcome disorder eating and eating disorders, body dissatisfaction and negative body image. Uh, regain or regaining periods, balancing hormones, and recovering from years of dieting by helping clients learn how to listen to their bodies. So if you're interested in working together or finding out more, you can head over to www.7-health.com forward slash help. So next week, and and actually for the next two weeks, uh, the podcast is going to be hosted by Lou and then Amanda. Uh, So I hope you enjoy these episodes. Um, I'll personally be back for the last episode in January and I will catch you then. Thanks for listening to Real Health Radio. If you are interested in more details, you can find them at the 7 Health website. That's www.7sevn-health.com.